One of the most significant features of the Blackstone Valley is its landscape, the historical pieces that tell the story of America's revolutions, its industrial and its transportation revolution. But after over 370 years of man's impact on the landscape, it is often very difficult to see our history because the landscape has been changed, altered. Not being able to see the true historical landscape creates countless questions as we attempt to understand our past. This is particularly true for the Blackstone Canal, which was a pretty impressive construction project. Built between 1824 and 1828, the canal trench, including 49 locks, ran from Providence, Rhode Island to Worcester, Massachusetts, and changed the landscape of the Blackstone Valley forever. Hi, I'm Ranger Chuck Arning with the National Park Service here in the John H. Chafee Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And can you picture Providence in the 1820s at the second attempt at building the Blackstone Canal? A bustling seaport with a multi-ethnic face, dialects from around the Atlantic seaboard, cargo from around the world, and yet no place to send it. Not without considerable cost, that is. And based on the success of that very large canal in New York State, the Erie Canal, the people of Blackstone Valley felt, finally, we have a solution to our problem on how to move merchandise inland. Now here we're standing on what was once the Great Salt Cove in Providence, Rhode Island. And by 1824, you could actually begin to see the construction of the Blackstone Canal here, this new technology. And as we entered the 175th anniversary of that first canal ride from Providence to Worcester, people want to honor the canal. They want to find it. They want to understand more about its history and its significance to our region. The problem is, where the heck is it? Very often you'll find it's filled in, like the Salt Cove, or the railroad tracks on top of it, or it's underneath roadways, or buildings, or mills, or hidden along isolated portions of the Blackstone River. But folks, because you're special, and we're pretty good detectives, us National Park Service rangers we are, we decided we're going to go on a little hunt, and we're going to find those portions of the canal that are still visible, that still connect us with our past. So tell you what, why don't you grab a pair of old clothes, boots, even waiters may come in handy and join us as we begin to uncover the hidden Blackstone Canal. Being a good detective requires some good research skills, some intuition, a little luck is handy, but also a map. And fortunately, when we're looking at the Blackstone Canal, we have a map. It's called the 1828 as-built map of the Blackstone Canal, also known as the Phelps map, named after the engineer who drew it. And it's a fascinating piece of artifacts to help us understand this fabulous canal. Now right now, in a nice warm environment of the Rhode Island Historical Society Library, my good friend and ranger colleague Kevin Kleiberg and Rhode Island Preservation and Cultural Heritage historian Rick Greenwood are actually going over this map and they're going to explain it to us so we can understand better what we see here in the field, what was actually written in 1828. What's fascinating here is, is how much the, the cove had changed even by this point in 1828 from, from the original natural cove. Right, from the great salt cove that, that the Narragansetts knew. Um, Waybosset Point we can still see here, but look, it's been crossed by bridges. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and there's this new structure up here, yes. washed in red on this 1828 map of the canal, uh, creating the canal basin. So it's already closing off part of the cove. And of course, in the, the heyday of the canal, it remained open, but it wasn't long after that that the shrinking of the cove began and basically brought it to nothing but a couple of channelized rivers. You know, we don't think of open water as, as the highway of commerce, but in 1828 that's really what it was. Sailing ships were the, were the way that you conducted business in America mm -hmm. and across the ocean. 
and getting your cargoes from those ships into the canal or from your canal boats and into the ships or the stores in downtown Providence uh, really made it essential that they move right along. Exactly how far they, they pulled those boats, we're not sure. Yeah. Uh, we do know they unloaded all along in here. Uh, there was a, a dock over here at the end of Hydraulion Street, which no longer exists. Uh, and I think it depended on the merchants, because these were all merchants' right. uh, wharves along here. And while it looks like a street, during a busy day, that would have had dray horses and wagons and carts and people moving these goods back and forth all the time. Mm. Rick, maybe just briefly, you could tell us a little bit about what's this, uh, this pinkish reddish blob sitting here at the bottom of the canal. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, canal Basin, yeah, we see the, we see the clue there. Uh, and as you say, Kevin, the, the Salt Cove, a natural tidal feature, is already being manipulated by, by the busy beavers in Providence. Uh, they've constructed this artificial dam across here with a spillway in case there's too much water in there. And then over here, a lock. Uh, not one of the lift locks that we see, we're going to see as we move up uphill to, to Worcester, but a guard lock. Um, a tidal lock, essentially, that allows uh, the boats to get uh, into a low water cove um, because this tide is rising and falling. They didn't want the canal to rise and fall at the same time, and so they constructed this tide lock as a way to keep the canal waters high when the tide dropped and then safely let them out without draining down the canal with the tide. And it's really great to see the level of detail on this. This, this artifact is amazing survival. Uh, done by the resident engineer for the canal as the canal was completed. And we can see from these pencil lines that he probably had this out in the field uh, and was making, making his notes on it and then took it back and completed it in, in ink mm -hmm. and color wash. Uh, and a, a sheet like this, um, for every stretch of the canal all the way up to Worcester. Oh, no, it's, it's fabulous to work with. And, and fascinating, because yeah. every time we look at it, we see something that we didn't see before, and sometimes it leads us to question things that we had thought before. Absolutely. Well, we were talking about moving up to Worcester, so let's talk about moving up with uh, the first one of our lift locks. It's got the two miter gates that point upstream so that the force of the water keeps the gates nice and tightly closed instead of pushing them open. Uh, because there was current in the canal. Mm -hmm. uh, it was flowing downstream. They just didn't want it to flow very quickly. And of course, this being in some of these stretches here, the actual bed of the Meshassic River, uh, it's in and out, a little, you know, on and on as we go along here. That dam is actually in a later incarnation still, still out there. Oh, right, yes. Uh, and, of course, wherever you see a dam, that's indicating that the river is making a sudden drop and drops were what the canal had to overcome, and they overcame it with lift locks. And so every time we come along and see a dam, we know we're going to see one, at least, if not more, locks, so the boats can bypass the dam and get up over that vertical drop. You know, the canal builders were as economical as they could be. Where they could use the river, they would go ahead and use it. But in some locations, they didn't like it for whatever reasons. We're not entirely sure, and of course, the lay of the land has changed quite a bit. But here, they decided to separate off the river and build their own channel, running past a little bit of old cut-off oxbow from the, from the Meshassic. Uh, and over on this side, they're actually staying out of the way of the raceway for another mill, Stephen Randall's paper mill, uh, which may have been what convinced them to, to build a, a separate loop mm -hmm. around here. Um, as we know, the mill owners were very jealous of, of the water in the river because that was really the source of their energy. And they didn't want the canal to take uh, any more of it or use it in a way that would interfere with their use. The canal, in this case, is running along in the Meshassic and then branching off on its own route here. And uh, it's very interesting because the Meshassic River over here has disappeared today. You can't find this. but if you go out to North Burial Ground in Providence, you will see the Meshassic River flowing in a nice stone-lined trench built in 1824 to 28 for the Blackstone Canal. So in that case, the what is the Meshassic River today is really the, the Blackstone Canal. That, that segment of the old river is gone. 
That's right. The old segment is, has been filled in. And uh, I think we're going to see that again in a few other segments as we work our way north where the, the river has sort of taken over the, the old canal. It's a nice, it's a straighter run. It's probably smoother for the, the water to flow through. Interesting here, Mr. Sanford Horton was one of those uh, entrepreneurs who saw benefit from the canal. He built Horton's Grove here just a short distance from downtown Providence and invited people to take a canal boat out to his, uh, to maybe have a, uh, a glass of wine and a, and a cup of chowder in his, his resort. And of course the novelty of the, the uh, canal and induced many people to, to make that trip as a, as a recreational turn. Let's continue our journey to the north. Uh, now I guess we'll be getting into uh, the town of Smithfield. Okay. And of course that would be today's Central Falls Lincoln area. And boy, we're racing along here. Bridge, continuing over the Mashasic River, mm -hmm. and interestingly here, there's a pretty clear case where the Mashasic is flowing downstream. It comes to this artificial trench of the canal, and they let the water flow right in because they want as much water in the canal right. as possible. If there's excess water, it's going to be spilling over a little dam underneath that bridge, and then flowing down in this uh, section of the river. They, keep those downstream mills happy. And right, and they can they can trap water here because there are no mills, and we see there are no right. locks till we get here. This is a pretty flat section. locks right on top of each other heading into Scott's Pond. Right. And this is where we are changing river valleys uh, and, and, and are beginning to change, leaving the Meshasic and we're, now we're going to work our way over and into the, the Blackstone. Blackstone. But not quite right. yet. Not, 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 quite not quite yet. yet. But, but if you figure these, these locks are maybe nine feet of lift, uh, we've got three of them yeah. here each. That's, that's 27 feet. That's a significant stepping up that they have to do here. Uh, and basically they're getting up on a ridge and then they're going to, once they clear and continue north, they will be sitting right in the valley of the Blackstone while the Meshasic is going to head to the northwest. A landmark that we can, can identify here, uh, the uh, Scott's Tavern, which is actually still there, mm -hmm. uh, now an insurance company, but at the corner of Lonsdale Road and Walker Street, a uh, tavern that dates back to colonial times. Uh, and a real uh, landmark for travelers along the way. To help us learn more about the canal in today's landscape, we're going to join Dave Barber, President of the American Canal Society. We're at Cranberry Pond, just south of Front Street in Lincoln, Rhode Island, and just north of Scott's Pond, at, which is over through the gap in between the two. Uh, the water level here is lower than it would have been in the canal operating period. And so the area behind us here, which is very shallow now, would have carried canal boats. And uh, by that means, crossed the watershed between the Moshasic area, which is here, and the Blackstone River, which is beyond. The fact is, you really don't see these ponds, you know, they're, they're just sort of a glance. Um, there's a lot of water in this area, and even, even um, to our east of here, there's more water. But you drive through on the ridges that separates it, and it's all built up with houses and that sort of thing. You see the houses, you don't see the water. That's a good point. If you can just take a quick casual look around here, 
We're really low compared to the rest of the landscape. And that makes a big difference. So if you take one of the uh, Explorer cruises out of Central Falls, you meet, which is just to the east or the southeast of here, you, you leave civilization almost immediately. You're in the, in the big marsh um, there. And civilization doesn't seem to be around at all. Yet, if you drive around there, there doesn't seem to be any marsh around at all. So it's, it's a very curious situation that we're, we're so low in the landscape that we miss most of the landscape around us. Okay, now we're reached the upper end of Cranberry Pond, and here we have what looks like canal. It's the right width, the right depth, it's sloped. So this, this may be an artificial construction. Maybe there was a, a small stream for drainage coming through this area from the hillside to the, to the left, but this is obvious, probably mostly been improved by man to create the canal. And going from Cran uh, Cranberry Pond here up towards the watershed, which is Front Street. Dave, if we go up a little further, we'll be able to see the, the connection to where the, uh, the Blackstone comes into play. Well, yes. Um, this, is, this is where we cross from the Meshasek Valley to the Blackstone Valley. And although it's called the Blackstone Canal, the, the southern few miles is actually not in the Blackstone Valley at all, but uh, in the Meshasek Valley. The thing was that uh, by the time the canal was actually built, the uh, mills were all built along Central Falls and various drops that occur along the river down to Pawtucket. And to go through that area would have been rather difficult would have had to buy expensive land and who knows what other kinds of legal problems they would have had. Plus, they really didn't want to go to Pawtucket because Pawtucket is not the largest city around. Providence is. And by crossing the watershed here and then maintaining this elevation all the way up to uh, Ashton, you could um, route the canal to, this, to the cove in Providence, which is a really important economic uh, point in this whole geographical area. So this is very important that they could cross the watershed here by raising the heights of these ponds and by carrying what on the other side of Front Street is an elevated canal bed all the way up uh, as the river, which is to our east, rises up the valley till finally they merge at Ashton. And you, if you look in this area, it really begins to make sense now. You can see from that canal bed there as we head up here, because right up there is the Pratt Dam there is what we know as the, the beginning of the bikeway right now. Right, just north of Lonsdale right. uh, Mill Yard. So you can really make the connection between here and, and the, uh, the true canal. And what does this show us? Uh, the Great Oxbow. And look how, look how close the two are here. And of course, this is right where the Blackstone uh, bike path runs right along the canal towpath today. Right, so this is where today folks, this is the spot that people are probably most familiar with in Rhode Island today because this is the spot for the past couple of years they've been able to walk and, and bike along. And so where this, uh, where the wash is, is, is where they're, they're out there biking and, and, and hiking. They're there. This is, this is undoubtedly the best preserved section uh, that exists in, in Rhode Island. Um, and it's, it's, if you've been out there, you realize how much higher you are uh, when you're up in the canal than you are in the river. And this is a great example of how important those locks were because by lifting up down there at Scott's Pond, they've been able to get up to this height while the river drops dramatically. Mm -hmm. And they stay at this higher level as they move along. Here we're six miles, seven mile, eight miles right up there. And by the eight mile marker, uh, we get uh, Gardner's Canoe Rock. And uh, that's a spot we want to take a closer look at, uh, getting out there uh, in the field and getting a chance to see the changes at the Canoe Rock as well as what's going on with the bike path today. So a great, uh, you know, here we are in 1828 on the map. Let's see what it looks like in the field today. Well, we're here one of those more hidden aspects of the Blackstone Canal with Al Clarberg, a noted independent researcher, scholar, and historian here in the Blackstone Valley. We're here on a really cool piece of the, of the right. towpath and the canal that most people never see. Yeah, this is, this is probably one of the most beautiful sections of the entire canal. It's called Canoe Rocks, 
Uh, it's located uh, in the uh, uh, old mill village of Quinville in Lincoln, Rhode Island, and we're about uh, 100 feet uh, uh, west of the bike path, and thousands of people walk by this and never get to enjoy the beauty. It's a really interesting place with lots of canal artifacts as well. Right. It took a while for people to realize that this is where the, uh, uh, the towpath actually went because they assumed that it was broad and wide. But it's only perhaps uh, four or five feet wide, but the horses uh, followed each other in single file. And so it was one of the narrower passages along the, uh, uh, the 45 miles, but um, it worked. Al, as we walk along this towpath a little bit here, why do you suppose this very pristine part of the canal has been uh, preserved so well? Well, Chuck, I think we start with the geology, and obviously the sloping uh, walls, once they were cut and uh, were polished by uh, storms over time, uh, became one of the, uh, uh, the permanent uh, uh, features of this section. And what's really interesting is the, the cut stone, which is also under where we're walking, but across the way as well, was like so, so well done uh, by the uh, Irish workmen uh, that in spite of the fact that occasionally trees tumble down and, and the roots rip it out, it hasn't had any maintenance in 175 years. And look at the, the quality of that stonework. It's really quite amazing. It is. It just, uh, again, uh, talks about the skill of these folks who uh, built right. the canal. Right. It's amazing what you see there. And I guess that's part of the story, that up and down the canal, the, the craftsmanship that went into building it was remarkable. Well, we were fortunate that uh, the Erie Canal completed its work when it did because it made it possible for Holmes Hutchinson and uh, Benjamin Wright to go to New York and to recruit uh, the, uh, the Irish workers who had spent the last few years uh, building the Erie. And so when they came, they came not only with their skill sets, but they also brought their tools. And they had had similar uh, issues uh, in building the Erie. So uh, this is a, perhaps an unintended dividend of that. Now there's a little mystery here by the Ashton Dam regarding how did the horses manage to pull the canal boat weighing up to 30 tons and get over that huge rock cliff there by the dam? Well, the theory is that uh, as, the, as the slope comes down, it's very similar to what we're looking at uh, uh, over here, that uh, holes were bored uh, into the side of the stone wall and then a form of, uh, of boardwalk was created. And as you can see, behind us here, the towpath is only five or six feet wide, so it would have been possible uh, to construct uh, some kind of a boardwalk, but it would have been like a cantilevered uh, affair, which would have been quite, uh, quite tricky, but, uh, uh, but I'm sure possible. Penciled in here, we see Sinking Fund, sort of an ominous name for a, for a textile village, but uh, it was given with good reason. And in much bolder letters, we see a Wilbur Kelly and a little building. Um, it's hard to tell from this map, but we know very well that that is Kelly's Cotton Factory. Kelly's Cotton Factory began uh, as the Smithfield Cotton Factory, and Simon Whipple and a group of his neighbors joined together with a George Olney, who knew a lot about machinery, to construct this factory. They began in 1809, but as the name Sinking Fund suggests, they had a hard time harnessing the Blackstone River and building a dam out here. Their first efforts washed out, and it really wasn't until the 18-teens that they got up and running. But running they were when the canal came through, and there had to be some delicate arrangements here because the raceway for the mill was already in place, and that's exactly where they wanted to run their canal. And there were these skillful negotiations, and leading those negotiations was this fellow, Wilbur Kelly. And he's got quite a story. He is a great transitional figure, really, uh, from Rhode Island being sort of a, uh, a merchant uh, economy into a industrial uh, textile economy. That's right. Wilbur, you know, is one of those people who really sort of is is like a uh, an agent of change here. Uh, we we talked earlier about Brown and Ives, and he he worked for Brown and Ives as a ship's captain and was one of the captains of their Great East India. Uh, sailing ships that, that sailed to India and, and to China. The Ann and Hope, a uh, familiar name yes, in Rhode Island. Yes, we all know and love here in Rhode Island. And he uh, very wisely saw that the coming thing was going to be in manufacturing. And so he 
He moved into that himself. And along the way, he became a, an agent of the Blackstone Canal Company as well. And the development of the canal and his acquisition of this factory happened at really at the same time, um, which I think is a good evidence of his, uh, his canniness and his ability to read um, the trends of the time. We can see that the, 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 uh, the towpath itself actually continued to run along then the Smithfield, now the Lincoln side of the river, um, crossing another little bridge. Uh, we can see this. Uh, oh, yeah. Coming down All right. Here well, right now we're just north of Ashton Dam, which is over here. And just into the, the wooded area to our right, um, the Blackstone Canal, coming from Providence, enters the Blackstone River for the first time. Um, this is a slack water pool formed by the dam. And originally, the elevation of this pool was carried in the canal all the way down to, through Scott's Pond, to uh, the village, the mill village down there one constant level. The um, canal at this point takes water from the river and the water removed from this river was part of the controversy of the canal in that it did not re-enter the river so therefore any water removed here was not available to the mill owners in Central Falls um, down in Pawtucket and there was a lot of legal action about that. And the canal followed that with the towpath as we can see here along the bank and it had to do that because if we look to our left you'll see there's a rock ledge here and to blast out a canal through this ledge would have been very difficult and expensive so instead of doing that they used the river and the Blackstone Canal does this several times on its way to Worcester at other similar places where there's ledge and, and a narrow valley However, that also causes a problem in that if the river is high in a flood or very low in a drought, it affects the navigation and there's nothing that the canal company can do about it. And so that's one of the problems when you're looking at uncovering the hidden canal is the fact the landscape has changed so dramatically since 1828. Man, nature, reclaiming land has right. changed a lot how we see the landscape today. Well, let's take a little hike up here and see how this uh, towpath goes here as we make our way north toward uh, Manville and Woonsocket. Well, this has been Ranger Chuck Arning with National Park Service in the John H. Chafee Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And one of the more fascinating aspects of our story for our uncovering the Hidden Canal, all the stories about the men who built it and used it. Folks like Samuel Horton and his resort, visionaries like Captain Wilbur Kelly and his mill, entrepreneurs like Stephen Smith, men who saw the vision of the canal and figured out a way to incorporate into their business and then make it work. The other fascinating aspect is how many people stories end up in this engineering story. Now we still have a long way to go. We're actually here in the canal bed in the village of Albion with a bikeway right up here and we still haven't even reached one socket yet. Do I hear a sequel? You bet I do. I tell you what folks, why don't you look for our part two of this story as we wander through the woodlands, the marshes, and the countryside of the Blackstone Valley in search of the hidden Blackstone Canal.